The following program presents principles designed to promote good health and is not intended to take the place of personalized professional care. The opinions and ideas expressed are those of the speaker. Viewers are encouraged to draw their own conclusions about the information presented. Hi, and welcome to Wonderfully Made. I'm Cheryl McWilliams, and our guest today is Dr. Timothy Howe, an internal medicine specialist at Parkview Adventist Medical Center. Welcome, Dr. Howe. Thank you. It's good to be here with you today. We're going to be talking about a topic that um, I don't know a lot about, and it's one that I think many of us don't know much about, and it's called the metabolic syndrome, or I believe also syndrome X. What exactly is that, and what effect does it have on us? Metabolic syndrome is not a disease. It is a clustering of signs and symptoms that when found together place you at higher risk for disease. As I think back over the past years in my medical practice, many patients come to mind and I think of watching them go through life, developing first the metabolic syndrome and then later, as time goes on, developing a whole, a whole group of diseases, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, cancer, and they all go back to metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome is the seed that develops or grows into a whole host of problems the chronic diseases that we here in America have today. Hmm. How, how is it determined? How do you know if you have it or not? Well, metabolic syndrome, one definition of it is insulin resistance. That is, insulin in our bodies is not working well. But how do we tell if someone has insulin resistance? there are five things that we can look at that give us a clue. And to have metabolic syndrome, you have to have three of those five. So here they are. Number one, a waist in men greater than 40 inches or in women of greater than 35 inches. Now, that's not hard to get. I'm not far off of that myself a little ways, and when I did the study on metabolic syndrome, you can bet that caught my attention and I started thinking, now, what size pants do I wear here? I, I want to make sure I don't get into the metabolic syndrome. 40 inches for men, greater than the 40 inches or greater, that's one. For women, 35. Another one of the five is blood pressure. If your blood pressure is greater than 130 over 85, that's another one of the signs of metabolic syndrome. Now that isn't very high. 130 over 85 is in the category that the Joint National Commission on Hypertension called prehypertension. But remember, normal blood pressure today is defined as 120 over 80 or less. So you're 10 points high. And if you have a blood pressure of 130 over 85, that's another one of the five. And if you have those two, you're well on the way. The third one is a blood sugar over 100. Now, blood sugar is normal at 100. It's actually, quote, normal from 60 to 120. But we started to find that if you get over 100, your blood sugar is associated with increased risk. In fact, if your sugar is 101, your risk for heart disease is 1% higher than if it's 100. If you're at 110, your risk for heart disease is 10% higher than if you're at 100. So for every one point your blood sugar exceeds 100 fasting, your risk of having a heart attack goes up 1%. So that's why it, too, is another sign or of the metabolic syndrome. So that's three. 
Another one is a low HDL. Now HDL is the good cholesterol. One of my patients told me how to remember it. It's not true, but it works. He said, H stands for healthy. It's the healthy cholesterol. Actually, H stands for high, high-density lipoprotein. High-density lipoprotein is a very important type of cholesterol. Actually, it's not a type of cholesterol. It's cholesterol being carried from the bloodstream back to the liver. If you will, HDL is like a garbage truck. It goes around the body and it picks up cholesterol, loads it in, and carries it back to the liver. In metabolic syndrome, your HDL, your good cholesterol, the garbage truck cholesterol, if you will, cleaning the arteries, is low. And if, as a woman, your HDL is less than 50, or as a man, if it's less than 40, you have another one of the indicators that you have metabolic syndrome. Very important. And lastly, triglycerides. Triglycerides are a blood fat. Your triglycerides go up in your blood if you've been eating a lot of sweets or a lot of fat. That's the main way you get it up. Or you can have a genetic tendency toward high, high triglycerides. But as with all genetics, genetics loads the gun, but it's environment that pulls the trigger. Just because your triglycerides are high doesn't mean you can't lower them with diet. But those are the five. And if you have three of those five, you are at increased risk for a whole host of diseases. So let me see if I can remember this. Okay. If, if my blood pressure is elevated. One, over 130 over, over 85. Over 130 over 85. If my waist as a female is greater than 35 or greater than 40 for a gentleman. If my HDL, which is the good cholesterol, is less than 50 for a female, less than 40 for a male, if I have elevated triglycerides. That's right. Or if your blood sugar is yes. over 100. Okay. And if you have any one, if you have three of those five, you have metabolic syndrome. Chances are, if you have two of them, you'll have a third because they cluster, and it's all from insulin resistance. Okay, so let's say that I did have three of these five. What would that mean? It would mean you're in trouble. Okay. And it would mean, as a result of being in trouble, that you needed to take steps to fix those. Now, the question is, is how do we fix them? But before we answer that question, let's look a little bit more at the problems that you have if the, you have the metabolic syndrome. And we mentioned them briefly, but let's look again. You have an increased risk for heart disease. Now, as I said, if your blood sugar is up one point above 100, your risk for having a heart attack goes up 1%. That's amazing because one point in blood sugar is really not that much. That's fasting blood sugar. Fasting blood sugar after an all-night fast. If your fasting blood sugar is over 100, that's one point for metabolic syndrome. If your blood pressure is over 130 over 85. Now, you say, well, that isn't much, and it isn't. But remember, studies have shown very clearly that for every, one, every two points that your blood pressure exceeds 120, your risk of having a heart attack goes up 10%, and your risk of having a stroke goes up 15%. So at 130, you're already 5 times 15 times greater risk for having a stroke or heart attack, 5 times 10, 50 percent higher risk for a heart attack with your blood pressure at 130 over 85. Wow. So that's why all that one gets in. Then you come to the waist. That waist measure, you say, well, how come? Because if I'm six foot four, as I am, shouldn't I be allowed to have a bigger waist? Mm -hmm. Well, as a matter of fact, no. When we start putting weight around our middles, that means insulin resistance. And insulin resistance, as I mentioned, is what's behind all of these pushing, pushing. Because insulin puts fat around your middle. 
And what we're really looking at is where are you putting your fat? Are you shaped like a pear, you know, with larger hips and thighs as a woman? Or are you shaped like an apple? Are you a man that has put weight on all over? Or did you put it all on right uh, above your belt? Because, of course, men wear their belt not on their waist, but today somewhere down below it. But still, do you have, where are you putting your weight? Because if you're putting your weight around your middle, you have insulin resistance. And that is really the key in the metabolic syndrome. So if I wanted to avoid the metabolic syndrome, or, or let's say I have these three things, what do I do to fix it? Well, the first thing you have to do is say to yourself, well, why is it that insulin isn't working well? And more importantly, what does it do in the first place? Insulin is a, like a key, and it opens the door and allows sugar out of your blood and into your cells. And you get insulin resistance when insulin has trouble getting sugar into the cell. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe you don't have a house like this, and of course I don't. But you may have seen some other people that have a house like this. You go over on a Saturday night, and, and uh, you, you sit down, and you, you're going to play some board games. And they say, oh, the game you want is in the closet. And so you start for the closet, and, and you get to the door, and you're about to open it. No, 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 don't open the closet. Uh, let, let me do it. And so they go over and, and they put one, they open it about three inches and they put their hand in, you know, to hold that up and then they carefully open the door and then it, despite all of their efforts, everything crashes down on them. That's the same problem that we have with insulin resistance. Insulin goes knocking on the door of the cell to open the door to get sugar in. But there's already too much fat or sugar calories in the cell and so he you know he goes to open the door but the cell says I don't want any more no more here thanks and so he has a hard time getting sugar out of the blood and into the cell now if this goes on long enough of course you develop diabetes frank diabetes and really what metabolic syndrome is is pre-diabetes mm. because if your sugar's over a hundred you have pre-diabetes if that's your fasting sugar. If your sugar is over 126, 126 or higher fasting, then you have diabetes. But remember that continuum. At 126, oh, you have diabetes, terrible. But you have a 26% increased risk of heart disease. How about at 125? You're not a diabetic. Or are you? See, it's not black and white, yes and no. It's a continuum. In metabolic syndrome, we're really looking at pre-diabetes. Insulin opens a door, but it doesn't work well if we've overeaten or eaten wrong. You put the weight around here, it's weight you don't need to carry, that spare tire. It tells you insulin's having a hard time. Why don't you give him a break? So metabolic syndrome is related to diabetes, then I, I would su assume then that if I wanted to avoid it, then I would do the same things that I would do to avoid diabetes. That's right. It's, uh, you, the metabolic syndrome just catches the problem earlier and says, all right, you have the precursors. We know what road you're on. We know where you're headed. Let's catch you before you get to trouble. And that's the beauty of the whole concept of metabolic syndrome. It allows you to detect the precursors of diabetes and interfere before you get into major trouble. And that's the beauty of the metabolic syndrome. It's other things too, but like for instance, when you have insulin resistance, you have thicker blood. The blood clots more easily, also raising your risk for stroke and heart attack. Uh, and that's an important thing to know for very sure. Now you mentioned that metabolic syndrome being related to the, the five factors, one of which was triglycerides. What exactly is that and what do I do about it? Triglycerides are fat in the blood and in our fat cells, that's triglycerides as well. Your triglycerides go up because you've overeaten or eaten too many sweets. You see the body, when you eat sugar that you don't burn, it stores it first, if there's excess, as glycogen in your liver. 
Glycogen is just a sugar molecule attached to a sugar, attached to a sugar, attached to a sugar, and it packs it up there in your liver. So you eat a good meal, uh, and the next morning you go out and run a marathon, your body says, well, he's not eating. Let's break down some glycogen and burn that so you can keep running and keep going on the glycogen. But if you're not out there running and you've eaten that big meal and you've filled up your glycogen stores, the body says, oh, where am I going to put it now? And it takes that sugar, changes it to a fat, and stores it as fat. Mm -hmm. That fat is triglycerides. Mm -hmm. So if you eat a lot of refined carbohydrates or just more than you need, the body changes it to triglycerides, and if you eat more fat than you need, it stores it as fat in your cells. It's interesting. You can see this in some individuals if you look in their eyes. Most people don't think about it, but if you stop and think, now let's see, if I was going to pour water out of a pitcher, it would go fast. If I was going to pour margarine out of a pitcher or butter, it would go slow, even if it was at room temperature, mm -hmm. because fat is thicker than water. You know, triglycerides thicken your blood. It makes it harder to pump. If you and I had a race, and I had a glass with water in it and a straw, and I gave you a glass of molasses, for instance, for one, and I said, okay, let's have a race. I'm going to sip water, you're going to sip molasses. Who'd win? <laughs> I think you would. <laughs> I would, sure. Sugar thickens the blood, and fat does it even more. So we're really looking at this through what are we doing to the thickness of the blood? Because metabolic syndrome is also, how thick is your blood? How hard is it to pump around? And when your triglycerides go up, your, thick, your blood thickens. It can get so bad that in your eyes you can see what's called box carring. And it's little globules of fat, and you can see them marching across the arteries in the backs of your eyes. Wow. going clunk, clunk, clunk like this because it's so thick and the, the big risk is stroke from having too high a triglycerides. That's quite rare, but it can happen from excess calorie intake. So you mentioned eating uh, refined carbohydrates. So then I would assume that uh, complex carbohydrate would be a, a good choice. Sure. If you, th if you go back to thinking about when we're eating and thinking about insulin and his work, he wants to move sugar out of the blood and into the cell. If you give him a steady stream of work and he can work just fine all day long, you know, you just uh, feed him uh, some whole wheat bread uh, and uh, that goes down into your system. You have to chew it, of course, and then you have all that fiber there that slows the absorption of the sugar and it, the sugar enters the body in a nice smooth stream. On the other hand, if you took a soda and just took the same amount of calories in the soda as you would in the whole wheat bread, 70 to 80 calories per slice, it would arrive fast. If it hits fast, insulin has to hurry to get it out, and it has to find places to stuff it quickly, and it says, hold it, hold it, I can't change, get all this into the cell, you better make some into fat. And so off into fat it goes, your triglycerides go up, your blood sugar's up because it got there too fast and we've got trouble. We've sludged the blood, and we've pushed our fats up and raised our risk for heart disease, stroke, and other things. Interesting. It seems that in everything that we do, physical activity plays a part. What role does physical activity play in, in this particular syndrome? Another way to define metabolic syndrome, of course, is more food in than energy out. We have an energy imbalance. We're eating more calories than we're burning. And metabolic syndrome can be reversed simply by increasing our exercise. Now, for some people, that's an awful lot of exercise. They say that you can run from Boston to New York on the calories in one pound of fat. Wow. Well, that's a lot of running some people might have to do. So if you're a big eater, you need to be a big exerciser. You can push the body too hard, of course. It's better to be a moderate eater and a moderate exerciser, always. If you push, you say, well, I want to eat 2,400, 3,000, 3,500 calories. 
a day, you're going to have to exercise very, very hard to keep your body from expanding and getting clogged up. But exercise is the key, or one of the keys, to reversing the metabolic syndrome. The other, of course, is to eat less calorically dense food. And that's the food that the Creator made for us. It's whole grains, it's fresh fruits, it's vegetables, staying away from the refined foods that are more calorically dense. They're the ones that it's easy to eat a lot of and get in trouble with. This concept of eating whole grains I find very interesting because there are a lot of folks who know that we should eat whole grains, but when you go to buy a, a package, it says whole grain on the outside of it. But I understand that a, a manufacturer can promote itself as, as whole grain and it only has to have 51%. So what exactly is a whole grain and how do I get more of it into my diet? I think it's very important for us to become smart shoppers, intelligent consumers, label readers. You know, you, you go to the store and it says wheat bread. And uh, you say, oh, this is good for me, wheat bread. And you pick up the package and you flip it over and the first ingredient is wheat flour. If it says wheat flour and not 100% whole wheat flour, it's white flour. And white flour, they've taken out the germ, and they've taken out the fiber, and they've taken out many of the B vitamins and the minerals, and then they say, well, we've taken all those out, let's throw a few vitamins back in, and they call it enriched. You know, you never buy white flour in the store, but it says enriched. Now, I don't know about you, but if I took 20 bucks from you and gave you five back, would you think you were enriched? I think I was ripped off. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happens with white flour and with our grains. So you have to be careful. You have to be a label reader unless you make your own. But it's very important to get all of those nutrients in our foods, especially in our grains. Uh, it helps us avoid delivering the calories, the sugar particularly, too rapidly to the body. If it's delivered too rapidly, we're in trouble. No question about it. So we're talking about eating 100% whole wheat bread versus white bread or brown rice as opposed to white rice. Another way to look at this, uh, this whole problem is using the concept of glycemic index. Now glycemic index does not work 100% because when we figure out the glycemic index, we're looking at various foods, we give you this and that's all and measure, but it's still a useful concept. It goes like this, we give sugar the number 100, pure glucose, you eat it, how fast does it get to your bloodstream? And then we compare other foods. For instance, white rice, boiled a good time till it's really cooked, has a glycemic index of 95. The sugar from white rice gets into your body almost as fast as pure sugar. Whereas brown rice has a glycemic index of 68. It delivers the sugar into your system much more slowly. Orange juice has a higher glycemic index than an orange. A baked potato has a lower glycemic index than mashed potatoes. Just the fact you mash them up, the glycemic index goes up. So you want whole foods naturally prepared. Now, some people say, well, then I shouldn't cook my food at all. No, that, let's not go overboard. Let's be, you know, sensible. Some things ought to be cooked. Some things need not be cooked. Carrots, you get more beta carotene and vitamin A from them if you cook them, as far as absorption. But I like raw carrots, too, and there's some enzymes and other things that come through better when it's raw. So, some raw, some cooked. That's a very good balance but avoid those refined carbohydrates that get right into your system. The worst thing you can do, and I think it's really the cause of much of the metabolic syndrome and of what's coming right behind it, diabetes and obesity, is refined carbohydrates between meals. Did you know that the average American male teenager, the average young man, drinks a liter of soda a day? Wow. A liter of soda a day. That's enough 
to give you metabolic syndrome over time, mm -hmm. and then diabetes and heart disease. We have an epidemic of excess refined calorie intake, particularly between meals. Grazing on this snack and that snack and the other one is, it, it really causes this whole problem. If we just eat natural foods, whole foods, get them from the farmer before they go in a box, if you eat them that way, spaghetti is another one, or, or uh, some of the other pastas, you can get wonderful whole wheat pasta today. Now, I didn't think so at first because I tasted a few that were kind of nasty, but if you shop around, there's some that really taste good. Whole wheat pasta, and that slows that sugar absorption down. It's so much better for you. Get your foods the way God created them. Cook them simply and you'll be much healthier, and you'll avoid that heart disease, that stroke. You'll also lower cancer risk. It really does help to eat good food the way it comes. So if we choose to eat our food the way God grew it, and we choose to get some physical activity, um, then it will help us to reduce that risk of, of metabolic syndrome. Absolutely. And reducing the risk of metabolic syndrome, as we've mentioned, is very important. It helps reduce your need for medication. It helps reduce your problems with a whole host of diseases. It'll reduce your doctor bills just from thinking about what you're eating and how you're eating it. You know, if you're going to spend money on food, don't buy the fanciest in a box. Buy wonderful fruit. There are fruit on the market today. I live in Maine. And I'm telling you, in Maine, they still have fresh oranges from Florida. You can get oranges from California. You can get fruit from Chile. You can get it from anywhere. It's all available, even that far north. We are without excuse today to get fresh food. Fresh frozen's fine. It's uh, very good, in some cases better. If you can't get that, canned. But as near natural, as near from the farmer's field as you can, that will really help. So we should pay attention to our blood pressure, our, our waists, our blood, our blood sugar, our triglyceride levels. Make sure that we're getting plenty of whole grains and natural foods the way God, God grew them and prepared them for us. And in this way, we'll help to reduce our risk of the metabolic syndrome and diabetes and heart disease and all of the other things that go along with it. It's something that we can do. It's simple and it doesn't cost any money. It will save us money and give us health. You can't beat that. And I think that's important. The more simple we can make things, um, the better off I think we often are. We tend to make things more complicated than they are. Thank you for joining us today on Wonderfully Made. I hope that you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And thank you, Dr. Hal, for being with us. Thank you. Good job.